Hello and welcome to Work Ready Helping Recruiters Help You. The event will begin promptly at 11 a.m. But before that, I wanted to come on here and do a quick tech check. So if you can hear me and see me and see the slide up on the screen, then you're good to go. However, if you're having trouble hearing me or seeing me or seeing the slide, do let me know in the chat and I will do my best to assist. If you'd like to listen to this presentation on the phone, that is an option. You can do that by calling 1669. 9006833 using the access code 848-9845-8254 and the passcode 123123. Once again, the program will begin at 11 a.m. and we'll see you there. Hello everyone, my name is Ole Kagan and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with LA County Library and I welcome you to Work Ready, helping recruiters help you. Before we get going with today's event, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping and tell you a little bit about the Work Ready program. So if you can hear me and see me and see the slide up on the screen, then you're good to go. However, if you're having trouble hearing me or seeing me or seeing the slide on the screen, do let me know in the chat and I'll do my best to assist. If you'd like to listen to this presentation on the phone, you can do that by calling 1669-900-6833 and using the access code 848-9845-8254. And the passcode 123123. You may have noticed that the mics and video for attendees has been disabled, and that's so everyone can focus on our presenter for the day. That isn't to say, however, that we don't welcome your questions and comments. We absolutely do. 
So if you have questions at any time during the presentation, put them in the Q&A box. That's the one with the two little speech bubbles. And we'll have plenty of time at the end of the program to cover your questions. And if you have comments during the presentation or want to respond to anything that our presenter says, put that in the chat and we will absolutely be able to see it. Again, we welcome your questions and comments. And now I'd like to tell you about the Work Ready program. Work Ready started in December of 2020 with the purpose of helping people get a job, improve their work situation, and plan a more sustainable career path. We do that in two ways. One, we do programs just like this one on all sorts of work-related topics from basics like resumes, cover letters, interviews, to deep dives into various careers and other subjects that help you succeed at work. And you can see any of over 50 of these past classes at any time by going to the work and career playlist on our YouTube channel. I'm gonna send put a link to that playlist in the chat right now. And the second way is that we lend out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots out of 27 library location, breaking down one barrier a job seeker might have in getting training or applying for jobs. So you can get laptops and hotspots out of those 27 locations. And we also offer laptops and hotspots at other locations now for six week periods. So if you need a computer and the internet for six weeks, we got you covered. The Work Ready program is made possible due to funds provided by the American Rescue Plan. And before we get going with the program, I'd also like to tell you about next week's event, Work Ready, an in-depth tour of Google Slides. So if you're interested in the presentation software that is offered for free by Google and Rivals PowerPoint in its quality, you can get a tour of that software next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. I'm going to post a link to that in the chat as well. Feel free to register. And it is, of course, free, just like all library programs. And if you're interested in learning more about library programs, you just go to our website, lacountylibrary.org. On the top right hand side, click events, and you get to see all the in person and virtual events we have out of 85 library locations for kids, teens, adults, and older adults. And if you're just interested in the virtual events, you can hover over that events button and there'll be a little drop down. You click virtual programming and you can just see the Zoom events like this one. You can sign up for any of them that you'd like. They're all, of course, free at lacountylibrary.org. And just a note, this presentation is being recorded. So if you have to leave early or if you miss any part of it, don't worry about furiously taking notes you will be able to see this presentation on our YouTube channel and you'll get an email with a link to that video. And I'm gonna post that as well in case anybody misses that. All right, it's time. It's time to get going with today's program. Our presenter for today is AJ Eckstein. He's the founder and host of the final round the go-to career platform to advance past the final round interview. He's a strategy consultant at a five, Fortune 500 consulting firm, helping leading media and tech clients with GTM strategy, product marketing, and innovation. He was invited to become a professional career coach for UCLA and writes for Business Insider and Fast Company. He was invited to join the LinkedIn Creators Program was named LinkedIn a LinkedIn top voice and became a LinkedIn learning instructor with two online courses launched, which by the way, you can get through LinkedIn learning for free with your library card. He graduated from the UC USC Marshall School of Business with a minor in digital entrepreneurship from the Viterbi School of Engineering. And he was previously on the business leadership rotation program at the Walt Disney Company. And with all that, I now welcome AJ to the stage. AJ, the stage is yours. Oleg, well, thank you so much for that intro. It's definitely a little bit awkward <laughs> hearing uh, hearing that that intro, but everybody, it's so great to be here and presenting alongside everybody. 
I've you know been chatting with Oleg over the last few months to have a very exciting uh, event like this. It's so important working with recruiters to help everybody get jobs. I also understand that this is around lunch, so I really appreciate everybody. Know everybody's crazy busy, so thank you so much for being here. I'm going to go ahead and share some slides, and I promise you, I'm going to bring the energy. So all I ask from everybody in return is to be active in the chat, to drop questions throughout the presentation. We'll have time at the end to answer all of your burning questions. And I promise you that you will take at least one thing away from this presentation today that will help you in your life, in your career, and in your job search. So let's dive in. So the first thing I want to ask, I always like to ask a question to the audience. Again, my goal is to make this engaging. I'm sure everyone here has been in those webinars that you don't say a word and you're doing five other things multitasking. So everybody can just drop a number if, if possible into the chat and let me know what your energy is right now. And to be honest with you, an hour before this, I was pretty tired. I had a shot of espresso. I'm getting closer to six, maybe seven, but let me know what your energy level is. And my goal by the end of the presentation is to increase your energy level as well as take one insight, at least one insight away from this. So I can see a bunch of numbers diving in. I see Eric, I think is at a seven, Vanessa's at a seven, Jamie's at a seven, Al's at a 100, Sarah's at a six, uh, Andre's at an eight, I love it. And again, my goal is to increase your energy by the end of this presentation. Okay, so the agenda for today, I always like to start off by sharing what we are going to talk about for the next about 45 minutes or so. so We'll start with a quick about me and about the final round. We'll then dive into the difference between recruiters and hiring managers. Then we'll talk about the different types of recruiters because if you know this or not, not every recruiter has the same role. It's important to know who to target and when and for what role. Then we'll talk about finding the right recruiter. Because again, it's hard to find that recruiter and you could be building a relationship with the best person, but they might not be best for that specific role. We'll then dive into best practices that I've learned from the recruiters that I've interviewed on my podcast. And then at the end, most importantly, we'll leave time for everybody here to ask their burning questions and we'll do our best to respond to as many questions as we can with time allotted. So let's dive in. So I know Oleg already gave a brief intro, uh, but born and raised in Los Angeles, went to Los Angeles Pierce College before transferring to USC. I'm the founder and host of The Final Round, which is a go-to career platform to knock out the competition and advance past the final round interview. I consult for Fortune 100 media and tech clients, formerly worked at Disney. I'm a LinkedIn top voice for hiring and I'm a professional career coach for UCLA. So if you can see here, kind of the main line you can draw throughout my career is I love everything relating to a career, to job search and just the overall work life world. So some metrics I think that matter to everybody, including myself is about the final round. So the final round is the top 1% most popular show out of 2 million shows globally. We have over 110 knockout stories, tons of five-star reviews, and have impacted over 25,000 job seekers globally. The final round is completely free. The thing I love about the LA County Library and their different uh, work ready programs is that they're also free. So we are aiming to democratize education around the job search and career world. We have a podcast, we have a YouTube channel and different online courses. We have a website blog, and we have a newsletter called the Knockout Newsletter. I think we can all agree that the odds of landing a job are stacked against you. I don't know if anybody's heard this, but I'm sure you've lived this, that it's a full-time job to land a full-time job, right? Job seekers have a 26% probability of receiving a job offer, which is pretty low, and every application has an 8.3% chance of proceeding to an interview. So the odds are stacked against you. And my goal in the next 45 minutes is to change that. And we're going to dive into some really important recruiter secrets that I've learned after interviewing over 30 recruiters from companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Spotify, LinkedIn, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, and more. So the first thing is the difference between recruiters and hiring managers. And I'd love, I'm going to take a quick pause. If you could add a question mark in the comments if you've also wondered this, or maybe you're wondering it right now, or maybe you thought that recruiters and hiring managers are the same people, add a question mark if you've been wondering what the difference is between a recruiter and a hiring manager. And I see Shirley added two question marks, Rachel added a question mark, and Matthew added a question mark. So let's talk about the key differences. And it's important because you need to know who you're talking to throughout the job search process because they're very different people who require different things. 
So starting off with where they work, recruiters work in HR, hiring managers work outside of HR. An example of this is let's say that you're pursuing a marketing strategy role. The recruiter could be helping recruit for that role, but the hiring manager is a manager in marketing strategy at Microsoft, let's say. Recruiters recruit for multiple roles in the company. Hiring managers help hire for roles just on their team. So again, going back to that example in marketing, if I'm AJ, I'm a manager in the marketing strategy team, I might be hiring two different roles. Maybe one is a social media role and one is a marketing analyst role. I'm only help, helping to hire for roles on my team versus a recruiter might be hiring for those marketing roles as well as a finance or accounting role outside of that team. Recruiters are usually very visible in the hiring process. They're your first point of contact. They'll have their contact information there. It's not that hard to find them. Hiring managers are usually not displayed, right? Their job is to focus on that marketing role. They only come into the picture in the later rounds of interviews. So it's usually hard to find them. Their information is not very public. Recruiters are always looking for talent. Hiring managers only really turn on that hiring manager hat when they need to fill open roles. When they're not looking to hire for those open roles, they're just doing their job of a manager in marketing, let's say. Recruiters are your first point of contact. They'll reach out to you, maybe schedule a phone screening interview to see if you're the right fit. Hiring managers, you'll only likely meet in the later or final rounds of interviews. Recruiters can tell you about the company culture and hiring managers can tell you about the team culture. And this is really important because let's say that Oleg has a call with uh, a phone screening call with a recruiter to talk about that same marketing role. It wouldn't be the best sense to ask questions about the day-to-day -day of that role or how long that person's been in that role because again, the recruiter doesn't always work in the position they're recruiting for. So you wanna ask, recruiter, uh, ask the recruiter questions about the overall company and the process versus the hiring manager when you're chatting with them and asking them questions in the interviews and calls, you ask them more of the day-to-day -day and how to grow in the role and the biggest challenges in the role and things like that. And this is so important because you need to tailor your questions depending on who you are chatting with. The last few here, recruiters know a general profile of the ideal candidate. Hiring managers know more of the day-to-day. -day. Recruiters receive the job descriptions. Hiring managers write the job descriptions. And the last two here, recruiters have less say if a candidate receives an offer. Hiring managers have more say. So if you're thinking about your networking approach, it could be really helpful to double down on trying to find the team or the hiring team in that, again, marketing role. And you will likely be working with the hiring manager, but not actually working with the recruiter. You might pass the HR team in the office and say, hey, to, the, to Oleg, who's the recruiter, but the hiring manager is one that you'll actually her marketing team. So again, this is such an important slide. If you haven't already, I would screenshot this. Again, this will be uh, recorded and put on YouTube, but this is such an important slide to know who you're working with and what they require and the different nuances between recruiters and hiring managers. Okay, so the next thing, what are the different types of recruiters, right? It's not just recruiter, but there, I'm sure you've heard of the different names, talent acquisition specialist, recruiter, sourcer, you know, technical, I mean, there's so many types of recruiters. I want you to add a number in the comments. Again, so this is getting more engagement from everybody, please add a number in the comments for how many types of recruiter roles there are. I'll give everybody a second and I'm gonna look for some activity in the chat. Give me a number of how many types of recruiters there are. And this is again, for the most common recruiters. I see Lisa said five, Ryan four, Cecilia three, Erica three or four, see a ton, Sarah said no idea, uh, Rachel said four. Okay, so the main types there's actually eight main types. And again, there's certain little nuances. There might be nine, there might be seven. I would say eight is the best way to think about it. And again, not just if you're chatting or communicating with a recruiter or a hiring manager, but as we dive into that recruiter bucket, what type of recruiter am I interacting with? And there's eight main ones. We'll start with corporate or in-house recruiter. Think of this as a recruiter that works at Google the recruiter only recruits for roles at Google. They're not gonna recruit for other tech companies. They're only going to recruit for that company. So they're called corporate or in-house recruiters because they work in-house and in like the company house. The next very common type of recruiter is an agency recruiter. So this person will work with clients on a consulting basis or a contract basis, and maybe their clients are Google, 
maybe their clients are Microsoft, Airbnb, Tesla. They're recruiting for multiple roles. They work for an agency that has multiple recruiters and the company is almost outsourcing their recruiting team to these agencies to go find talent. So if someone reaches out to you and they say, hey, Oleg, I have a great role at Apple for you. But you see that that person doesn't work at Apple. They work at, you know, Oleg staffing agency. You know that they're an agency recruiter. So they're working on behalf of the company and that recruiter likely can't tell you a lot about the company or the day to day. Next, we have an executive recruiter or a headhunter. These types of recruiters are mainly focused on staffing very high level roles. Think CEO, COO, head of accounting, chief financial, uh, financial officer, anything that's very, very, very senior head of product. And these are not entry level roles. So a recruiter will focus on just those very, very, very senior roles. Then we have a technical recruiter. If you think about what you need to know as a recruiter to hire software engineers, hire people in data science, right? You need to have some technical knowledge. And these are what technical recruiters focus on, very technical roles, usually the roles that are non-business focused, that are very technical, very data focused, some type of engineering, machine learning, AI, that's a technical recruiter. And again, why is this important, you might be asking, is if you're pursuing a marketing role and you find a technical recruiter at Google, they're not the best person to reach out to because they're not recruiting for marketing roles. But if you're someone who's pursuing software engineering, that could be a perfect person to reach out to. The last four here, campus recruiter. There are certain recruiters who are have a sole job to focus on building relationships with campuses. Think of LA Pierce College, USC, UCLA, whatever it may be. They build relationships with organizations on campus and they really focus on hiring entry-level talent. So if you're someone who might be a few years out of school, maybe you never went to school in the first place, campus recruiter is probably not that best point of contact. The last three here, a talent sourcer. Think of this as the sales team of the recruiting team. These people do more outbound than a normal recruiter would get inbound. They would reach out to, let's say, Larry Miller, and they say, hey, Larry, I think you'd be a great fit for this job. Here's the job description. You should apply. So their goal is to get you to apply, and they're trying to source talent more outbound. The last two here, DE&I Recruiter. DE&I stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Recruiter. And there are some recruiters, especially at the bigger companies, where their sole focus is to bring diverse talent into the company. So they'll partner with diverse organizations. They'll focus on really building that diversity and inclusion in the office. And the last one here is a full cycle recruiter. Full cycle recruiters are very busy because they do every step of the recruitment process. They might take the role of a talent sourcer and actually source the talent. And they might go all the way through the process to actually help you onboard. So again, these are the eight types of the recruiters. And again, you might be asking, what do I take away from this? Is when you are doing your outreach through your job search, when you're trying to target people to network with and ask questions, think about A, am I reaching out to a recruiter or a hiring manager? And within the recruiter bucket, am I reaching out to the right recruiter? Because some of these companies have hundreds, if not thousands of recruiters, and it's important to know, am I reaching out to the right person? Okay. As we dive through here, and again, if you guys have any questions, there's a Q&A function, the two little speech bubbles. I see that some people are already dropping questions in there. Make sure to drop them in there and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So the next part here is how to find the right recruiter, right? Let's say that you are looking for that software engineering job at Google, you know that you wanna find a technical recruiter. How do you find the right recruiter when there's so many? And the answer to this is filtering on LinkedIn. So I'm actually gonna jump out of this deck for a second. I'm gonna dive into LinkedIn and I wanna show you a couple of things. So again, going back to that same example and I'm gonna uh, zoom in here just so everyone can see it. Going back to that example of looking for a technical recruiter in tech, this is a great person, Marisa Jones. I actually ironically interviewed her on the Find Around podcast. She's a technical recruiter focusing on hiring engineering leadership at Airbnb. So again, if you're going for a role that's not technical, but it's at Airbnb, She's not a great person to reach out to, okay? The next few ones here, Annie Hopkins, another person that I interviewed on the podcast, she's focused, she works at a very large bank and she focuses on early careers. So one of the biggest pain points that recruiters have shared with me on the show is that they get so much outreach, but it's not thoughtful outreach. If you're going for a mid career role and you have 10 years of experience, why would you reach out to Annie if she's focused on early careers, like, yes, she could recommend you to the other recruiter, but oftentimes they're so busy. They're not even going to respond to you versus if I'm a student 
and I want to work at this bank, I understand that she focuses on early careers. So she will likely respond more to me than to your type of outreach. She also previously worked at Goldman Sachs in diversity recruiting. So that fills that bucket of DE and I recruiting. If you're a diverse candidate, that'd be a great person to reach out to. The last three here that I wanted to show you, Elizabeth, you can see here executive search and she is a, an executive recruiter at Google. You can go through here and read specifically what she looks for. She's a lead executive recruiter, also does de &I work, and she focuses on hiring a very senior uh, level executive at Google. The last two here, Manju. So Manju is a great example. Let's say that she reaches out to Erica and she says, hey, Erica, I have an amazing role at this tech company. Here's the salary. You might be asking, okay, tell me more about that tech company. And the tech company is called Tesla. Right. But you see that Manju does not work at Tesla. So she would be an agency recruiter because she works at a staffing agency. Right. And you can see here that she does not work at the company that she's recruiting for. So she's recruiting and helping other companies, multiple companies. She does not work at that company that she's recruiting for. And the last one here that I wanted to show you is I believe this is Kamara. She's a university recruiter. So, again, if you are trying to target Microsoft and work at this amazing company, and you have 15 years of experience and you're a very senior person entering the work or diving back into the workforce, why would you reach out to Kamara if there are other better recruiters to reach out to if she literally focuses on university recruiting, right? And that wouldn't be the best use of your time. And you can see here that she focuses on interns. She focuses on helping people at these universities. So again, what do you take away from this is do not just have a rapid fire approach and reach out to any recruiter. There's so many recruiters. Make sure, and we'll talk about outreach in a second, but make sure you're reaching out to the right recruiter, okay? And one thing I wanted to show you is, again, how to find that right recruiter. Knowing that there are multiple types, how do you find that right recruiter? So you, I, what I would say is go on LinkedIn. And for instance, we would talk about Google. We've been using Google as an example. You search Google in the search bar. I'll try to go slow here if people are following along or if they want to take notes. So you go to Google. And you click on, this is called a LinkedIn company page, okay? So you go to Google's LinkedIn company page and you click on Google. We'll give that a second to load. And again, to find the right recruiter for us and the role that we're targeting, okay? So now this is the LinkedIn company page. You can see that there are 280,000 employees. So you cannot spend every hour of every day of every year trying to network with every single employee. We'll click on the employees. And now we're gonna use again, that filtered search to find um, that uh, specific recruiter. Oops, sorry, back here for a second. Okay, perfect. So there are, again, 200, let's say 80,000 results. And you can't just look for anybody. So we are gonna use this all filters button right here and the beauty of LinkedIn, yes, LinkedIn is a place to find jobs. And yes, LinkedIn is a place to network, but it's also a database. Think about how many data points LinkedIn collects across everybody. They have a, almost a billion members around the world. So you go through here and you can look at connection of, maybe they're a connection of me, maybe they're a connection of Oleg, followers of, location. They talk about Google Cloud. Maybe the role you're focusing on is on you know, marketing at Google Cloud, current company past company, maybe you work at Disney, you're trying to work at Google. So you want to find people who work at Google, but previously worked at Disney, maybe school, you want to search by LA Pierce College, you want to search by USC, whatever it is, industry, profile language, open to service categories and keywords. So I will preface by saying that ideally, you'd find that perfect person who has every similar interest to you, similar background, same school, same location. It's hard to find that person, especially at companies that are not Google size. And you have to play around with the filtering. But let me just show you. So for keywords, for title, we are gonna put recruiter. We're gonna hit show results. And out of, instead of, I think it was 280,000, now we went down substantially to 1,600. Fantastic. 1,600. 100 is still a number that is way too large to chat with everybody. So we're going to go back to all filters and we're going to try to go a little bit deeper. So I don't care about the other companies that Google owns or acquired. So I'm going to uncheck YouTube X, Adometry, capital G, just focus on Google. 
And then maybe for, we'll go back up to location. Since I know a lot of people here, if not everybody is in Los Angeles, we will type in Los Angeles, show results. And again, we're gonna continue to narrow and narrow and narrow the results. So now through filtering, we went from 280,000 people at Google to then filter by recruiters, filter by LA. Now we only have 41 results. This is much easier for us to now find a person to reach out to. So the last thing I would say for another filter is what if you're going for non-business roles and you're going again for more technical roles, you can add the word technical for the title and it goes from 41 to 17. And all of these people here, technical sourcer, technical recruiter, technical recruiter, recruiting software engineers, we went from 280,000 people to now 17. And this is how you have a more targeted approach to outreach, to networking, to building those relationships, to not just applying on LinkedIn, but then following up with a recruiter in LA since it's a role in LA and you're focused on software engineering. And it literally says technical recruiter in LA focused on hiring software engineers. Okay. So I know this was a lot and you might need to go back to the YouTube recording to follow along, but just remember that not every recruiter is the same or even hiring manager is the same. Find the right person to reach out to because if I reach out to Linda and I'm, I'm applying for a role in New York, she lives in LA or Orange County. I'm applying to a non-technical role and she's a technical sourcer. She's not going to respond. So people will respond to more targeted outreach. Okay. Amazing. We are going to dive back into the deck and keep going. Okay, perfect. So now the question is, okay, well, I found the right recruiter. What are some tips on sending tailored outreach message? And this is something that the recruiters have shared with me again on the final round. So these are some best practices when you're sending that outreach. The first thing is you need to show that you research the person. It's amazing even how much outreach I get and it says hi, comma, it doesn't even have my name. It's very generic, it looks like a template and I'm only gonna respond to the person if they researched me. Because why would I give up time on my weekend to chat with them if they couldn't take the time to reach out to me in a very effective way? So avoid generic templates and do your research. The next thing, and I love doing this, is anytime I'm writing an outreach message, I know the other person's busy. Think about how much outreach the recruiter receives on a daily basis from people just like yourself, candidates trying to work at that company. Ask yourself, is this tailored enough? Did I show that I am interested enough in this company and role? Did I research the person? Am I using first name personalization? It sounds so simple, but if it says high comma versus high AJ, I will respond to high AJ much more likely than high comma because that's a template, right? So ask yourself, would you respond to your own outreach message? If you're saying, ah, it's a little too generic, probably make it more tailored. If you're saying, whoa, I'm reading this. And even if they say no, they'll still respond and say, hey, I'm too busy right now, but amazing message. And let's stay in touch maybe in two months once I finish this project, right? You need to explain why you're reaching out. It's very frustrating for recruiters and including myself who receives a lot of outreach to not understand why you're reaching out. So please, please, please do not just say, hi, Benji, how are you? Or hi, Benji, and wait for the other person to respond. No one has time to go back and forth, especially on LinkedIn or especially on cold outreach to go back and forth. So just say everything you're asking for or why you're reaching out in that first initial message. I won't respond when someone says, hi, AJ, but I will respond if they say, hi, AJ, hope you're doing well. Saw you're in LA and also went to Pierce College. I graduated in X year. Love your podcast. Season six, episode five with Benji was fantastic. I love the quote he said about sending tailored outreach. That's what I'm doing today. I saw that you are recruiting for XYZ role. Here's the job ID. Here's my resume. Let me know if you'd like to chat. Right. You see how much more of a thorough question that is. And I'm going to give a thorough response. So share why you're reaching out. Could be for a coffee chat to network, asking about a role, share the job ID and the details. Don't just say, hey, I'm applying to a role at Google. OK, well, there's a thousand open roles. And don't just say a marketing role. Give the name of the role. Give the job ID, how you applied, when you applied. The more details, the better. Attach your resume if you are asking about a specific role because they're likely going to ask for it. So you save them an extra step include that first name, say why you'd be a good fit for the role. And please do not just say hello, 
or can I ask you a question? Just ask the question. It's very frustrating when you get those questions because we don't have time to go back and forth. And the time is going to be an extra week for me to go back and then you go back and it's, it's just too much. So these are some great tips on sending tailored outreach. Okay. As we keep moving, some best practices working with recruiters. And I want to, I want to preface by saying that these are practices that were shared by actual recruiters on the final round. This is not just my tips or just tips that I read in an article and you'll see how it's evidence backed because I have exact quotes from the recruiters. So let's talk about some best practices. The first one, so this was from Chris Geringer, who was the number one recommended recruiter on LinkedIn. He's recruited at Apple, Salesforce, Tesla, and Binti. And a great way to think about how to get jobs at these companies is to connect the dots between you and the company. So if you can't even figure out why you deserve a job at Apple or at Tesla or whatever company, how will a recruiter or a hiring manager make that connection? So you as the candidate need to connect those dots. If anybody here is techie, you'll understand this analogy that Chris Geringer said, where you want to connect the endpoints of an API, like an API, an application program interface. You want to connect you as the candidate to the job or the role they're applying to and make that connection between the two. Make it so easy to understand that I can take this and share it with the hiring manager, right? Find every single opportunity where you can speak to showcase your abilities, whether it's you're in school, your project work, whether you're outside of school, an internship, another job, even if it is not a perfect internship, like you worked in a restaurant for 10 years, explain how the customer service skills that you gained in that job will transfer and translate to this new job in customer service at Apple, okay? So again, the, one of the biggest tips to start with from Chris, connect the dots between you and the company. The next one here is from a recruiter at Facebook or Meta, Nikki Woodall. She gave so many great tips in this episode. It's episode eight of season one, but practice mock interviews extensively. I know it sounds like pretty obvious advice, but if you think about the overall recruitment process, there's not much that you as a candidate can control. You can't control if they're going to say yes. You can't control who you're going to get as an interviewer. You can't control what they're looking for. But one of the few things you can control is how well you do in the interview and how much you prepare. So Nikki Woodall sh uh, shared, focus on mock interviews. That's the number one thing since you have control over how much you prepare, okay? And a mock interview could be behavioral questions, your elevator pitch, tell me about yourself. It could be technical questions if it's a technical interview. It could be a case question, a financial question, depending on the role you're applying to, of course. But you should perform so well in the interview that even in the case that you not get this specific job, the recruiter's like, oh my God, they'd be an amazing fit for the company. They weren't the best fit for this specific role, but I wanna place them in a different role at this company because they'd be a great fit. So she would say, oh, I remember they nailed that interview for software engineering. They didn't have enough technical skills, but they would be a perfect fit at Apple. So let me place them in this data science role and I'll recommend them to the next recruiter who recruits for that role. Or maybe I'll reach back out saying, hey, you should apply to this, you'd be a great fit. So again, the takeaways for number two, practice mock interviews extensively because it's one of the few things that you as the candidate can control. Number three, take ownership of your career. I know all of us can agree that trying to find a job is a full-time job in itself and it's stressful and it can take months, if not a year plus to find that great role at that great company. And you have other things going on and your mindset is maybe not in the best place and you're lacking the motivation, you're doing a million other things, maybe you have kids, maybe you're still in school, maybe you're trying to find time to do it all, it's stressful. But you need to take advantage of the opportunity and take ownership of your career. And Farah, who was a recruiter at TikTok, everybody's heard TikTok here, she said that you shouldn't blame anybody, right? The sad reality of applying for jobs is that you will lose more than you win. So given that understanding, you need to take ownership, right? So don't blame the recruiters. Don't blame the hiring managers. Don't say the process is broken. There's a lot of ways that recruiters, hiring managers, the overall process can be fixed and improved, but it's not a lot of things that we as candidates can control. So focus on what you can control, like those mock interviews that Nikki said, and take ownership of your career. Remember that quick and easy is a scam. Those get rich quick schemes don't work. So you need to work hard, trust the process, believe in yourself, be confident, put yourself in a position for the best opportunities 
and the rest will fall into place. Number four, lean on your recruiter. I say this so much, especially in the content that I post and create on LinkedIn, but recruiters are your friends. They are not out to get you. They are not out to ask Oleg a tough question for him to slip up and say, ah, I got you. I asked him a tricky question and he messed up. They're not out to get you. That'd be a waste of their time, frankly, right? What they're trying to do is they're trying to fill roles at the company they recruit for with the best person that fits the criteria in the job description. That's it. So if you are a great candidate that fits, let's say 80% of what the job description is asking for, why would they not want to put you in the best position to land that role? Because they're measured as recruiters for bringing in top talent. So if you're that top talent, lean on your recruiter. They're going to help you. They will pick favorites throughout the process. So be that favorite person in the process. So when you're going through the recruitment process, do not do it on your own. And don't be afraid to ask questions. The recruiter is there to help you. And you're missing out if you don't ask them questions. So Marisa here, who I actually showed you ironically on LinkedIn a few uh, minutes ago, is a senior technical recruiter at Airbnb. And she really encouraged candidates to lean more on your recruiter than you think you should. Ask questions to them in the calls that you have with them. They'll know a lot about the process. Maybe they help form some of the interview questions. And they work hand in hand. They partner with the hiring manager. They might not have as much say as the hiring manager, as we shared on that slide of recruiters versus hiring managers, but they do have a say. And if they like you, they'll try to push you through. So again, number four, lean on your recruiter. Number five, be authentic and unapologetically yourself. It's always sad to see that people will land roles at companies. And that's great. They got their foot in the door. Now they're hired, they're employed. And then they last at the company for a month because the person and the persona they were throughout the interview process was not Jack, was not Stephanie. They were putting on a mask just to get the job. So Hannah Wolf here, who's a recruiter at Spotify, I'm sure everybody here has heard of Spotify. Maybe you're listening to a podcast right before this webinar. Hannah from Spotify says to be authentic, to be yourself. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of trying to be that ideal candidate of what you think Tesla or Google or Microsoft or the LA County Library, if they're trying to hire somebody, right? Who do they want? But be yourself because you won't last long at the company. So Hannah says, authenticity and being your genuine, genuine self is honestly the best way to go. Show who you are, show up as you are. I know that companies like fill in the blank, really appreciate people for their uniqueness and their diversity. So don't try so hard to fit in that you sound like a robot. If you want to work at the company, let that shine through, show your interests and show your authentic self. So again, number five, be authentic and be unapologetically yourself. The last two here, I promise you guys hang with me. We'll get some time to ask for you guys to ask all your questions is number six, adopt the George Clooney mindset. And this is a tip from Leah Frank, who is a former recruiting lead at Bain and McKinsey, two top consulting firms. And whether you believe it or not, recruiters want you to win. And Leah shared a really interesting story on the final round where she said that there's this mindset that George Clooney had. And he would go into all of his initial auditions thinking that the directors wanted him to mess up, wanted him not to succeed. And it's very similar to interviewing for a job. Right. I've gone into interviews saying like, man, that was a tough question. I think they're making me or they're trying to make me mess up or trip up or fall into a trap. But if you take a step back, that's a waste of everybody's time. It's a waste of my time as a candidate. It's a waste of their time as a recruiter or a hiring manager. So they're not sitting there aiming to reject you. And the farther along you get through the interview process, the more time they've spent with you, the more they like you, the more they want to push you through all the way to the interview or to the um offer, excuse me. So they're rooting for you, whether you believe it or not. And if you go in scared, not confident, you're going to mess up. But if you go in there knowing that their interests are aligned with yours and you're a top talent and you have relevant experience, then don't do what George Clooney did in his initial auditions. Do what he's doing now where he's a top actor and he's landing all of his auditions and getting those top roles at the top movies, TV shows. But for you as a job seeker, landing those top offers. And the last one here, number seven, arguably the most important that I save for last, and it sounds so simple, but you need to build your self-confidence. Erica, who is a recruiter at McKinsey & Company, 
said that 40% of recruiters will not hire candidates who are not confident in themselves. So imagine you check off every box. You have a perfect resume, a great story in your cover letter, an amazing LinkedIn. You have the needed technical skills, the soft skills. You've built relationships with everybody. But once you get to that stage and you need to perform in the interview, you're timid. You're not selling yourself. You're not giving a good story. You're not, again, connecting the endpoints, like Chris said, from Apple of connecting you as the candidate to the company and how you can fill that role. You need to be confident. So strip away the, I don't have relevant experience. Will I be a good fit? Get rid of the imposter syndrome. Throw it so far away that it's outside of LA County. Okay. Maybe in Northern California. And instead, think about what you do have, what you do bring to the table, and leverage those skills to put yourself in a better light. I think everybody here, and I'm actually curious, again, I'm going to ask the chat for a second. I want you to say yes in the chat if you've ever experienced or are experiencing imposter syndrome. I'm even going to join you. I'm going to say yes as well, because I've had it. I still have it for a lot of things that I do, maybe even Today in this webinar, I'm like, am I even the right person to speak on behalf of this topic, right? And I see Andrea said, LOL, yes. I see that uh, Anita said, yes, all caps. Cecilia said, yes. I'm seeing a lot of yeses, okay? But I will say that you need to, and I do believe, fake it till you make it. And if you don't have the skills today for the role, say what you do have and say how you're going to build a plan to build those skills on the job, right? A lot of what you do on the job is found in on-the-job training. I went to school for four years and very little to any of what I learned in school is actually what I do in my day-to-day -day full-time job, right? So again, going back to Erica's point here and everybody here says that you've had imposter syndrome, if you are going to get rejected, right? Do not self-reject yourself. If someone's gonna reject you, let the recruiter, let the hiring manager reject you and you'll be proud of yourself and you'll pat yourself on the back and say, you know what? I give it my all. I walked in confidently. I didn't have imposter syndrome in the interview, even though I was so scared and had butterflies because we all do in these interviews and it's a scary process and it's not fair and it's not easy, but I walked in there, gave it my all and that's that onto the next company. The worst feeling is not the feeling of rejection, it's the feeling of regret, right? Regretting that you should have given it your all and that somebody else who you were competing with for that one role got it and they were not as experienced or talented as you, but they walked in more confidently. So I think a lot of people here, you might be introverted. I consider myself an extroverted introvert. It's a lot to be here. I know I can't see everybody's face, but I know there's a lot. I think we have almost 80 people in the crowd. It's intimidating being here, but I'm gonna give it my all. and I'm gonna walk away from whatever opportunity I have on the table and say, I give it my all. I'll fake it till I make it. I don't want imposter syndrome in the situation and I'm gonna be confident. And the last quote I'll leave you with is according to Harris Poll, 39% of job seekers leave a bad impression due to confidence, voice quality, or a lack of smile. So can you imagine if, again, you check off every box in the book of what you need and your voice quality was not loud enough, you didn't have enough confidence, you were so timid that you didn't really build a relationship with the recruiter or the hiring manager because you weren't smiling versus walking in, smiling, how excited I am to be here. This is my dream role. Let's say it's a role at Disney. Explain how you have kids, let's say, and how you take the kids to Disneyland and your whole life you've been growing up watching Disney movies, that needs to portray, especially for these virtual interviews, portray through the screen. So imagine if you have all of that, but you were too afraid to say that. So you walk in a little bit robotic, very buttoned up, very scared, very timid. Your voice kind of goes a bit lower and lower. You're not confident. And the recruiter doesn't say, go to the next round or to the final round because you didn't bring your best self and your confidence was not built. So one more tip I will say for number seven, you might be asking, okay, AJ, I agree with you. It's important to have confidence. I see Eddie here said I'm an introvert. Again, I'm an extroverted introvert. I feel you, Eddie. But you might say, how do I build my self-confidence, right? I would say two ways. The first one is you just need to be comfortable in your, own, in your own skin, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is going back to those mock interviews. What I used to do to prepare for the difficult interviews that I had coming up for that job search is I would ask myself common questions or have a friend ask me record myself on Zoom like this and rewatch how I responded to those questions. Was I getting a pen and clicking every five seconds because I was so afraid? Was I stumbling? Was I saying, um, was I saying like, was I a bit timid in the process? And be very honest with yourself, be very constructive in your feedback. 
And I think those recorded mock interviews, especially a lot of interviews are virtual today, will really help you build confidence. And ask yourself, you know, how can you be better? If you were grading yourself amongst other people, would you push yourself forward? And if not, what did you miss? How can you be more confident? Can you give another smile in that Disney example? Talk about how you love Disney. It's an amazing company and it'd be a dream to work there. So again, number seven, build your self-confidence. It is so, so, so important. Okay, let's dive into the next one. All right, so what is your energy level now out of curiosity? And hopefully is a little bit higher than what you had before. I'm super excited to be here and I'd love if you can drop a number. I see Matthew still at 10, amazing. So Matthew, I'm glad I didn't go down to eight or seven. I see an 11. I see some high numbers, James and eight, amazing. I know lunch is, you either had lunch or at lunch or you have lunch coming up. See someone asking a quote, I love it. Um, so this is amazing. The last few things here before we will dive into some Q&A, I think we have about 80 people joining, is I'd love to connect with you. So I have two QR codes here if you have your phone handy. The right phone that you see with a little picture of me in the suit and tie and the boxing gloves, that is to check out our website. The it's just thefinalround.com, super easy. Again, everything that we have on the website is completely free. We believe in democratizing access to knocking out the competition and advancing past the final round in your job search. We have a podcast, newsletter, amongst a ton of other free career resources. And the phone on the left is my LinkedIn. I post a ton of free career content, career tips, job search tips, recruiter insight on my LinkedIn. So I'll leave this for a second for everybody if you want to screenshot it. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Just search up AJ Eckstein. And again, the final round is just thefinalround.com. Super simple domain to remember. I'll give everybody a second uh, if you are interested in learning more. And again, not trying to sell you guys on anything. Almost everything that I do is just sharing career wisdom that I learned from experts like the recruiters that I interview. And one other thing I'd like to ask you is before we dive into Q&A, I see we have more and more questions being added. So I would love for everybody, if you have a question, to add questions in that Q&A box. And then Oleg and I are going to try to respond to as many questions as possible. So again, scan these and add your questions. And I believe that is everything before we dive into some Q&A. So I will pass it back to Oleg as people are adding questions. And I love to see all this engagement. AJ, thank you very much for your energy. I could few the people in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for your energy and thank you for these excellent tips. Um, we've got some questions here, and I they're they're great questions. And so I think that this will be another excellent part of the presentation. So let's get into the first question. And that is, are cover letters important when submitting a job application online? So I see that Eddie uh, asked this question. Eddie, thank you so much for your engagement. I saw you were super engaged in the chat. So we appreciate it. I know a lot of the other audience members appreciate it. And this is such an important question. And it's very funny. And, and I wish I could say either just yes or no. I would say it depends. Some recruiters that we've had on the show are obsessed with cover letters. And what they've said in this, I'm thinking of episode one with a recruiter from the Boston Consulting Group, Bruce. Bruce said that I go to the cover letter to answer questions that I had about their resume, right? So the cover letter could be thought of as a piece of information where you could explain something that happened. Let's say that you took a three-year career gap, maybe because you were on paternity leave and you had a kid Maybe you went to go travel. Maybe you had some family thing, whatever it is. And it doesn't matter what it is because everyone is entitled to a gap in their career. But I will say that you don't want recruiters trying to figure out why there is a gap or why there is an issue of what happened, right? Maybe you left school early if you went to school. Maybe you didn't go to school at all and that's totally fine. So think of the cover letter as a way to address potential concerns, a way to express interest. I would, if I had to rank cover letters and recruiters, or sorry, cover letters and resumes. Resumes are definitely way more important than cover letters because some recruiters don't even look at cover letters. Some recruiters don't require cover letters. And some recruiters have openly gone on LinkedIn and saying, I hate cover letters. They need to die. I will not look at them, right? So knowing that, spend more time on the resume. I will always say that in a lot of job applications, the cover letter might be optional. And I'm someone where if I'm a recruiter, and I'm in between two candidates 
one of them took the time to write a nice cover letter and one of them did not upload the cover letter, right? Is that going to instantly get you the job offer? Probably not. But is it going to be a little bit of another data point, another indicator to say, okay, Oleg's probably really interested in this role at Google if he took the time to write that tailored cover letter. So don't give other people a reason to reject you if it's things that you can control. So long story short, Eddie, resume first, put more time into your resume, then cover letter. You can also, don't tailor by company, tailor by industry. So I work in, let's say management consulting. So I'll have a, a fairly good template that I'll use for all the consulting companies that I was applying to. And then for each company, add a few sentences to tweak it and tailor it to that specific company. But you don't need to make a customized cover letter for hundreds of roles that you're applying to. And based on previous work ready programs, I would say that that you're on target there and that, that unless they specify no cover letters, cover letters are yes, still important. Yes. Any specific advice? And we actually had this question from a few different people. Um, any specific advice for job seekers who are in their late 50s or just older adults looking to re-enter the job market? So I, I said there was a few a few streams of this question. Um, advice for older adults, advice for people returning to the job market as older adults. I would say I have, I have two tips here. And I think uh, Cynthia, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a great question. We get asked that a lot. The first one I would say is think about the experience that you have had in the past and try to dive back into what you were doing. I think it could be tricky at a later age to try to reinvent your career. And let's say that for the last 20, 30 years, you were working in marketing, and then now you wanna be a software engineer for whatever reason, that's a tricky story to tell. Well, I what I would say is number one, the cover letter is gonna be your best friend because again, going back to Eddie's question, you can explain why you're re-entering the workforce or what that career gap was or your interest in that company or role. But I would really focus on your, your experience that you have, right? And yes, maybe you think that companies want younger talent in general, but think about all the knowledge that you've gained and what you've been doing and how that translates to your role. The last thing I will say is try to find a company that you can relate to more. You know, I think Google's a great example where like they have a ton of internship programs. They have a ton of university recruiters and maybe the people at Google historically are people more out of college that grow in the company. Try to find a company where your friends are working at around the same age. Try to find companies where you see somebody on LinkedIn, just say, hey, I got a job, so excited. And that was a friend from college that graduated the same year as you. Ask them for advice, right? Try to find the companies that already hire talent in your same age, um, same age. It's the same thing where if you're someone in the military, try to find a company that loves hiring veterans, right? If you're someone who didn't go to school, didn't go to college, find a company that hires people who never went to college, right? And the last thing I will say is if you are an international a student or a person in the US and you didn't, um, let's say you don't have uh, a visa or you're on a visa and you need sponsorship to work at a company, find the companies that are openly expressing how they sponsor talent because other companies maybe don't. So don't waste your time at certain companies who aren't going to accept you. It's going to take some time, take some research, take some, you know, uh, filtering on LinkedIn, but the more research you do, the better your approach will be. Sounds good. Yeah, I don't know if there's any, any really magic bullet in this situation. I mean, you just do the applications stuff, do the research. Like you said, that it's a good point. Look at who's already there. Exactly. All right, the next question is, how would you find the right recruiter on Indeed? So Matthew, it's a great question. I will say again, going back to that slide I had of recruiters versus hiring managers, on some applications, especially I would say on LinkedIn specifically, the recruiters will be public information. They will say, this is the recruiter that is recruiting for this role. And if you have that, great. You should reach out to them for sure. But on certain job applications or job descriptions, like let's say Eddie on Indeed, they won't be listed. What I would recommend doing is doing the same exercise that we did of trying to, and it's kind of a guessing game. You're acting as a detective, right? That true crime detective trying out, trying to find out who's that right person and going on to LinkedIn and using LinkedIn filtered search, which is going to be your best friend and try to find that right person. And again, if it's a software engineering role at a certain company, do not waste your time reaching out to non-technical recruiters. And the same thing is on the other way. So make sure you're reaching out to the right person. 
The second thing I will say, and I've heard this from the recruiters on our show, is recruiters think of them as the gatekeepers. They're your first point of contact in the process. But there have been times where I've landed job offers and I never even spoke to a recruiter because I was able to find the hiring manager. So at the same time as you're looking for that recruiter, if it's a very niche role, let's say that you're trying to become a business analyst at LinkedIn to work at LinkedIn in their new podcast network business group that they just that said that they just recently launched, right? It's not going to be that hard. There's probably five people max on that team, maybe 10, but try to find that team on LinkedIn and network with the team members who are likely influencing the hiring decision instead of the recruiter for that role, because recruiters might not always share exactly the roles that they're recruiting for, especially if it's a technical recruiter or so many technical roles or just a business recruiter, but try to find the hiring team. And sometimes I've found that hiring team. I've had networking chats with the hiring manager before I even officially had an interview with them. So don't sleep on trying to find the hiring team and just use the job description to your advantage and use those keywords to find that right person on LinkedIn. Sounds good. So then uh, here's the, here's something that so many people are afraid of when they're putting themselves out there by messaging somebody cold. What if the recruiter doesn't reply when you reach out? So again, put yourself in the shoes of a recruiter. There's a lot of outreach that they get a lot across LinkedIn, cold email, internal, whatever it is. The first thing I would say is go back to your message that you sent them and ask yourself, Again, the tip that I shared, would you have responded to the message that you received given how busy you are? And be honest, if it's a no, it needs to be better, more tailored, more effective. If it's a yes, then there's things outside of your control. Maybe the recruiter that you reached out to doesn't check LinkedIn. Maybe they're not great with email. Maybe they're just busy. Maybe they're on vacation and they don't have their notifications on, right? So I wouldn't focus too much on one person. That being said, recruiters have shared that very few people follow up. So if it's a person that you have a lot of similarities with, and what I mean by similarities with is they went to the same school as you, same hometown, they worked in the same former company, whatever it is, find similarities with these people. And if you know it's a great person to connect with, right, follow up and do not follow up the next day. I would say give it at least three to four days, maybe the following week, and just be respectful about the follow up. You can probably follow up a third time, two, three weeks after. But after two or three times, I'd move on to the next person because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. It's a sales approach. So I forgot who asked that question, but don't take it personal. It needs to be, it's a numbers game, but it's a targeted numbers game and reach out to the next person. So if you don't get a response, the follow-up after a few days or a week, and then follow up again after two or three weeks. And that's a, that's a, a way to a procedure. So if you're scared and don't know what to do, just use that. Well, I'll give you I'll give you one more piece of insight, Oleg. I've heard people say, and especially recruiters, that if the person really cares and really wants to chat with me, they'll follow up a second time. Right? So if you do care, follow up because you again, how can you be one step above your competition who's applying for that role? And not many people, if any people, follow up. So if you can follow up, it shows, wow, they're really interested in chatting with me. Let me give them, you know, a piece of, of my time. So it's like you're thinking of that first, they may be thinking of that first uh, reach out as a test. Exactly. Say, Hold on a second. Exactly. Okay, now this person's like, this person's serious. Exactly. All right. Um, let's see. Um, a corporate recruiter for a former employer reached out to me about an open job for the same job title I'm working uh, for now for someone else. I'm a senior level employee and this job does not reach that level. And it's questionable there would be a chance to rise to that level at this company. The recruiter handles several divisions within this company. So here's the question. Is there a way to bring this up to see if there are other fits within the company? It's a great question. I would say I would do two things. Number one, I would research the company and see if they have a careers page or go on LinkedIn and find the LinkedIn jobs for that page. But most companies, especially I would say the mid to large companies have a career page and see if there are open roles, right? You don't want to come off as someone who didn't do research. So imagine you reach out to that recruiter and say, Hey, are there any roles in the marketing team? I don't really want to do finance. And they said, yep. On our careers page, we have five open marketing roles. 
it shows me as a recruiter that you didn't do any research. The first thing is do your research. The second thing is either, let's say they don't hire for those roles. They're not currently hiring, but they don't have a careers page. I would have this conversation over the phone or over Zoom. I think these types of conversations, same thing with a negotiation when you receive an offer should not be done via email. You also maybe don't want a paper trail because you're currently working in another company. So I would hop on a call or hop on a Zoom and explain how the company's of interest, the role is not the best fit, but given your expertise, your strengths, your experience, you'd be a great fit for this other role and try to find someone else at that company that you're talking about that has that role so you know it exists. Sounds good. For the next question, I have my own point of view as an interviewer, but I'm curious what, what you think and what has been your experience when interviewing recruiters. Um, during an interview, how long should the interview take? And then would asking too many questions at the end hurt your chances at getting the job? So Eddie, love this. And again, thank you so much for so much engagement in today's webinar. So I think that, and I know this from experience, that I've bombed certain interviews. I've done so poorly, messed up on questions, wasn't as confident, but I was able to salvage the interview and get to the next round because of the last five to 10 minutes of the questions that I asked at the end. I would say most candidates, mis the, the mistake that they make is that they think that the interview's over when Oleg stops asking me questions. He's the recruiter or, or the hiring manager, I'm the candidate. And then he says, do you have any questions for me? And I say, Oh, okay, the interview's done. I can chill. I can go, you know, lounge on a chair, drink a, you know, my, my drink, whatever it is. The interview's not over. The interview's over once you both leave the interview. So this Eddie is where you set yourself apart as a candidate. How I ask great questions is I think of what everybody else is going to ask and how can I do that better? I want, let's say Oleg, who's the hiring manager or the recruiter in this scenario to basically say, wow, great question whoa, I've never heard of that before. What now you're getting me thinking, no one's ever asked me that, right? So the first thing I would say is you need to ask good questions that are unique to the person, to the company or to the industry that you're applying to. I wouldn't say there's a perfect time. I'd be mindful of time. So let's say that the interview is an hour, you got interviewed for 50 minutes. Don't think that you're gonna ask 30 minutes of questions, right? And be mindful, I would also even say, once it's at the hour, say, oh, like, thank you so much. I have a couple more questions, but I know we're at time. I want to be respectful of your time. So it's not a, a, a time game. It's how good and how in-depth your questions can be. You want to be tailored to Oleg, to the company, or to the industry. And do your research to ask good questions. And it could literally be one question that you ask that you get so deep and there's so much back and forth versus trying to just fire off 50 questions. It's not, again, a numbers game with questions. It's how good the questions could be. And if I ask a great question and Oleg responds, and then I add on, and it's a tennis match, and we're going back and forth, right? That is a great way to build that relationship that you need with the recruiter or hiring manager versus just firing off 20 questions and add on to what they're saying. That sounds about right. My, my point of view is that it when you're answering a question, when you're answering questions at an interview, no more than two or three minutes. Because once, because if they have six or 10 questions, that's going to end up being just about the right length for the interview. If you start answering five, 10 minute responses, you're, it's going to be way longer than the t they have enough time for. That's hard for me as somebody who was like, was a talker. I always have to be like, stop. And um, one more but, thing, yeah. Oleg, I don't know if, Ed, I, I believe Eddie was saying questions at the end of the interview that yeah, the candidate also, asked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if you were also to answer the question of how long should your responses be? Yeah, because it's like, how that, long should the interview take? That's that yes. was his first question. So yeah, in that situation, uh, it depends on how many questions they have, but each question, I mean, each, your response should be, a, I, I think about two or three minutes. What do you think? I would say, again, there's not a golden number. I would look at the body language of the other person. If they're super intrigued, oh my God, tell me about yourself and that your story keeps building and getting better. And I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat, so enthralled in what you're saying, I'm going to keep going. But still, two to three minutes is probably a good framework. But if I'm on minute three and I can see that the body language is looking the other way and I'm losing interest, then try to wrap it up. But again, instead of just blurting out a long response, try to use a framework and use, for instance, star, situation, task, action, result to stay structured. And again, if you do mock interviews and you're watching yourself back and you're falling asleep with your own responses, it's probably too long. So make sure that you are doing that mock interview practice as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it it can be challenging. If you if you're bored by your yourself drawing on, then yeah, that 
the frameworks. That's very helpful. Any advice on identifying recruiters specializing in the fields of corporate sustainability and social impact, either at a private corporation or independent agency? Uh, I find it difficult to find these recruiters as this is a niche or smaller field. It's a great, great question. Um, I know it's an anonymous question. I would say you're not going to find the recruiter. There's not going because there's not enough roles to fill for corporate sustainability. As important as it is, you're not going to find a recruiter that says corporate sustainability recruiter. So what I would do and what I would focus all my effort on with your outreach and networking is find the team that works in corporate sustainability. So going back again, and you can watch the recording on YouTube of how he went to LinkedIn, searched by company, and in that keywords section, in that title section, say the words corporate, say the words sustainability, play around with it, add it together, and find people who work at that company in that team and reach out to them versus trying to find a recruiter that maybe doesn't even exist or that it's going to be impossible to figure out. Yes, having those conversations, very important. Um, next question is, um, do you think it's realistic to pursue roles which with which you, where you don't fully satisfy the qualifications, the time and a position or specific skills, et cetera. Love this question, Nathan. Uh, one of my favorite quotes on the final round is, and write this down, I've written this down many times and I keep telling people, I even tell myself this if I'm applying to a role. A job description is a wish list. It is not a list where you will check off every single requirement. Okay, I'm gonna say that again because it's so important. A job description is a wish list. If you meet 100% of the requirements in a job description. Are you ready for this? The bombshell, you are overqualified. There needs to be some room to grow in the role, to learn on the job, to grow at the company, whatever it may be. So I would say if you fit 80% of the requirements, you should apply. There have been roles where I was not qualified for, but I still got an interview and I explained how I was going to connect the dots and learn on the job and take online courses and whatever it needed, whatever I needed to get that job and I was able to get that offer. So again, do not worry if you don't meet 100% of the requirements, know that it is a wish list. Obviously, and I wanna preface by saying that if it's a software engineering job and you meet all of the software or all of the soft skill requirements, but it's a technical role and you don't know how to code, that is an issue I wouldn't apply to that. But if it's a role where you meet 80% of the requirements and the rest you can learn on the job or the rest you can explain how you're learning currently, how you're upskilling and training, you should still apply. When in doubt, apply. It's not that hard to apply. And you don't want to look back and regret not applying. You'd rather get rejected. I promise you that rejection is way worse than regret. You've got to have the essentials for the job, but there's so many things around that to where, you know, make it a possibility for yourself to, to actually move forward. And, and again, going back to the other point, Oleg, why would you self-reject yourself? If you are going to get rejected, let somebody else do it. But imagine you are rejecting yourself. Do not do that. Have someone else. Give them you. the chance. <laughs> Give the chance. Give them the opportunity to, to reject you. Exactly. <laughs> um, so there's a question. I'm not totally sure what the question means, but it's uh, was the YouTube link. So I, I mean, for, well, we can answer this. Do you have a YouTube channel for the final round? I'm curious. We do, but I, I'm assuming this uh, this person is, is the link this? for this for this recording yeah that's that's yes. the other thought that i had so yeah so this the youtube link for this session will be out um, when i send the follow-up email so probably i'll be editing it today or tomorrow and throwing it up on youtube probably tomorrow so I'll, when i send the follow-up email to everybody who's registered for this program that which means you out there um you will receive an email with the follow-up link with the email that that you registered and there you'll see you the YouTube link and other information about this presentation. So you, you will receive it, fear not. All right, recently laid off, taking the summer to be with my son who's moving out soon. Is a short gap or a slow walk job search seen as a negative? I don't think it's a negative if you can explain it again in that cover letter or even on LinkedIn now, there's a way to add gap on your work experience and explain and say laid off, you know, spent time with my son in the summer. That's totally fine, but don't give recruiters a way to speculate what's going on. So I think, yes, you need to take time. And again, I'm, by the way, I'm so sorry to hear about the layoff, but so many people have gotten impacted by the layoffs that it is not uncommon to take time to recharge your batteries, to think about what you want to pursue now. It's difficult. I will say you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and I have, or even on, on our website, thefinalround.com. 
We have an amazing, what we call layoff care package, completely free, 25 page layoff care package for anyone who was recently laid off or a friend that you might know, family member. And it goes through every step you should take to get through that layoff successfully and find that new job. So it's a great free resource that we have on our website. But again, I don't think it's, it's bad. I wouldn't make the gap five years, 10 years, if you're able to you know, apply to roles. I think the less of a gap, the better, because then it's just a story that's easier to tell, but take the time you need to rest and recharge. If it's just a few months of gap, that's pretty normal. I mean, think about it when somebody gets laid off and they have to start a job search from scratch. A few months is a pretty normal amount of time to be looking for a job. So if it's, you know, under six months, I mean, that isn't even something that really needs to be explained a whole lot. I mean, that's just chalked off to a job search. All right. And the next question is, what is the best way to contact a recruitment company uh, like Robert Half? So I'd love to know, Andy, um, if this is, are you trying to work as a recruiter at Robert Half? Are you trying to contact a recruiter who works at Robert Half? I'll answer both. So usually these companies have a contact form that you can reach out to maybe on the bottom in the footer of every page of their uh, website page, they'll have a contact email. But if not, I would just go and search Robert Half on LinkedIn and find the contact and reach out to that contact and ask the question that you need to ask. Sounds good. So we have, uh, we have 18 questions left and we just have a few minutes. So we're, we're going to cover as many questions as we can, but then what, we do, have, we do have to uh, get off pretty soon. So if you don't get your question answered, feel free to follow up by email and we will try our best to answer your questions. Uh, I'm an older employee who used to be a mid-level professional. I'm now just looking for a job like an administrative assistant or bank teller. Not sure how to explain that I want to work, but not necessarily in a high-level role. Somebody is voluntarily demoting themselves. So first off, Shirley, great to meet you. And I think it's a, it's a really relevant question. I would say the best way to show them is what job you're applying to. You know, if you're applying to a role and you're showing interest, I can tell that you want to work in that role. And then once you get the interview or you have any communication with the recruiter or hiring manager, you can just explain. I, I wouldn't come off, and I'm not saying you're coming off as this, but don't make them think that you don't want to work harder in a more senior role. But just say that this is the role that interests you and you know you can do an amazing job and you have the relevant experience. And given that you've been more senior uh, in different roles in the past, that you can really crush that role and provide a ton of value to that company. There's a, there's a person that I know works for the county, work, was at a very high level in one of our departments. And after doing that for a while, she decided that towards the end of her career, she wanted to do something that provided more personal satisfaction for her. And so she took a lower position on purpose. And it seemed like, you know, her, the way she explained it was that it's it's better for me now. It, it fits with my values now. So, you know, she seems very happy about it. So it seems like, I mean, it's something that people do and maybe more people should be okay with doing. All right, next question. I'm in contact with an artistic recruiter. I worked in TV. How do I keep in touch with him? I email him when I have any portfolio updates, but I don't know if that's too impersonal. So first off, Lily, I love how you are thinking about the importance of keeping a relationship strong, keeping it warm, not letting it get cold, and the importance of following up. Not enough people are like you, and they don't follow up. I always feel almost used when someone reaches out to me, shows so much interest, wants to chat about X, Y, Z, and then there are ghosts and you never hear from them again. So if someone spends the time, gives you the time out of their busy day or weekend to chat with you about whatever it is, they want to hear from you again. Maybe they don't have the time to hop on a meeting you know, every week or to chat every week, but you want to keep the relationship warm. You don't have to do it every week, every month, but every few months, it's totally fine. And remember that it doesn't have to be a meeting every month or every few months. It could be as simple as connecting on LinkedIn. Maybe they post a ton of content. You're always engaging with their content. What I mean by engaging is liking, liking their posts and adding thoughtful comments and tagging them. And the irony is maybe you're never chatting directly, LinkedIn message, email. But if Oleg always, let's say, posts content about the importance of reading and the importance of libraries and communities, obviously, I think that is very on brand for Oleg. And I add in saying, Yes, my experience when I was, let's say, growing up in the importance of a library in my community near my home and X, Y, Z thing, we're not chatting directly. 
and then maybe he responds to my comment, but that's actually fault, like staying in touch with them and staying top of mind with each other. Right. And let the other person make that first move and say, Hey, oh, like, so, or, oh, wait, oh, Hey, Jake, so great to see you or hear about you again. Let's hop on a call. Or they might just say, Hey, Jay, over message, you know, what are the updates? How have you been? And sometimes people don't want to hop on another call, but you can stay with people over LinkedIn message, over email by not hopping on a call or, or phone call, or even wishing them a happy birthday if you have notifications on. Or I think it, you said it was an artistic uh, recruiter, and I think it was in the TV industry. So maybe in your chat with them, you guys spoke about AI and TV, and you see that there's a strike going on in Hollywood right now. So maybe LinkedIn messaging them or emailing them saying, hey, so-and-so, you know, thought about you when I read this article. Can you believe what's going on? Hope all is well. And they might say, yes, crazy. Let's hop on a catch-up call. Or maybe just say, yep, it's a crazy story. Hope you're, going, you're doing well. I just came back from a trip. So those are some ways that you can stay in touch with your network by not needing to hop on another call every single time. Sarah, yes, right. that was the, the example that I was giving. I know there's a strike right now uh, with AI in, in Hollywood. One of our people is, is, she says in the chat, I'm literally at the strike right now. Oh, at the strike. Yeah, You're solidarity. Crazy. Okay. Um, so let's do two more questions, if that's okay, AJ. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question is, I was out of work for a long time because of health problems. How do I address that on LinkedIn? It is very uncomfortable. Totally understand, Eric. And I think that's another extremely important question. I would say that I think it's important to address it, but you don't have to go into the details of it. And I think a great place for that would be, let's say, in your cover letter or even on LinkedIn. And again, you can go as broad as you can, like took time off due to, you could say, a family matter, a health matter. I think that's totally fine and do what you feel comfortable with. But you need to give some explanation because the recruiter might not know that and they might think you just took five years off or whatever it is. So again, you don't want to give the other person an opportunity to speculate. And in the actual interview, you could be much more honest about what happened. Again, you don't have to go into details of the health matter, but you could be more specific about what happened, how it affected you, how you've changed and whatnot. But I think it is important to at least say why you've taken time off again, which is totally fine. And people, everybody has, you know, different health problems or conditions, but you, I think it's important to address it or you won't even get the opportunity to share more about it in the interview because the application process will be difficult. So just, I would say, address at a high level. I think what you said is really important that so many people are hit with health problems, have to be caretakers for their parents or whoever in their family or children. Um, there's so many reasons for somebody to have a an employment gap that that shouldn't be considered some sort of stigma. I mean, it's it's a normal thing that happens in people's lives. So just saying I had I was out because of health issues is is not something that is is outstanding or remarkable in any way. All right, uh, final question: um, What do you think of content drafted by Chat GPT? Does it sound <clears throat> as fake as I think it does? So James, love this question. What a great question to to end on. I know we spoke about AI and TV in Hollywood. So cool to see that we're ending on another question about AI. AI is undoubtedly the future. I think the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai, said AI is the most revolutionary technology of this generation. So it's no, there's no doubt that it's it's not revolutionary. It's it's not going anywhere. What I would say, and I read a, a great quote uh, or statistic that almost 40% of job seekers now are using AI to help them in their job search. So I would say if you're not using it, you're at a disadvantage. The next question is, okay, to what extent do you use it? Right. So it should never be something where it writes your resume and that's it. And you're uploading that resume or it writes your cover letter or it writes your email drafts for you. What I would say, though, is it is a co-pilot. Right. So it's not flying the plane for you. It is sitting in the co-pilot seat, helping you fly the plane better. And it's holding the plane as you run to the restroom and you go eat and you come back. Right. That's a great analogy. So even in content creation, you should not say, hey, write me a LinkedIn post about X, Y, Z copy it, paste it, it's obvious. But what it can help you with is removing writer's block, helping with brainstorming, helping you dissect something, making maybe a feedback that you got on a certain part of your resume was that you need to add more quantifiable metrics and impact about your experience working at Tesla. So you go to ChatGPT and say, hey, what would be some great metrics to share during my time in marketing 
in social media as an analyst at Tesla. And it might say, oh, well, social media analysts are usually measured on, you know, impressions, followers, X, Y, Z. And it gives you ideas to then write your resume. So how I would say again is do not copy and paste. It's a great starting point. It's there to assist you, not to replace you, but I think you should be using it. And it's very, very, very helpful in the job search. I think which meant for the cover letter, if if Chet, if you just outsource your cover letter writing to ChatGPT, it's definitely not going to speak in your voice. It doesn't know who you are. But for wordsmithing parts of your resume, that's outstanding. How do I say X, Y, and Z in different ways? It'll give you like three or four different options and you can play with those options. And that doesn't, that's not being dishonest. It isn't, it's not pr providing you with, you know, skills that it makes up. It's just saying it differently. And that's, it can be helpful. It can be like what you said, it can help you with your brainstorming, jog your mind to come up with other ideas, or I mean, it might be just a good idea. Remember the last thing I'll say about AI is it's always going to miss the human touch, which is where you as the human need to go in and add that human touch. So if it's helping you with your resume, fantastic, but go in here and, and dissect your resume and say, okay, what sounds, you know, maybe not accurate versus what, how do I add that human element of emotion and everything that we are as humans versus, you know, AI. So that's very important. We're also coming out with a ton more AI and job search content on the and just my, you know, content on LinkedIn. So such, such, such an important topic to end on for today. That's the, that is, is exactly the perfect place to end. You know, what are we talking about? Helping recruiters help you. The human touch when you reach out to recruiters, you do it to human to human. AJ, thank you so much for this excellent presentation and taking the time to answer the questions of our audience. Uh, for the folks out there, thank you for being here. Feel free to reach out via follow-up email. I'm going to post a link to the post-event survey in the chat right now. If you have one or two minutes, please help us by filling out that survey. Let us know what you felt about this presentation and topics you'd like us to cover in the future. We do these Work Ready programs in order to help you. So thank you, AJ. Thank you to all out there. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. And thank you for the opportunity.